Hey guys, I'm Phil. Welcome to Phil's Computer Lab. Today we are entering a really exciting time. A time of processor and graphics performance growing at an amazing rate. And it all starts with the very first Intel Pentium 2 running at a fairly low 233 MHz. This video is packed with information and benchmarks, so I will showcase a few games here and there throughout the video to break it up a little. In the background we can see Incoming, a popular 1998 game used frequently by sites such as Tom's Hardware, a review site that was extremely popular back in the day. The game has gorgeous graphics, comes with a built-in benchmark feature and is quite fun although a little bit repetitive. The Pentium 2 233 launched in May of 1997. It certainly wasn't a cheap CPU, setting you back 636 US dollars according to CPUworld.com. Unlike previous processors, this one doesn't use a socket at all. It comes in a single edge contact cartridge and is compatible with slot 1 motherboards. The entire slot 1 platform is known for being extremely stable, reliable, compatible and of course very fast. To ensure that you get this awesome slot 1 experience, I highly recommend that you get yourself a motherboard with the famous Intel 440BX chipset. This chipset is so good that it is used as a reference in many emulators and virtual machines. The Pentium 2 233 runs with a frontside bus frequency of 66 MHz. It has a 3.5x multiplier, which gives it an internal clock speed of 233 MHz. Command and Conquer Tiberian Sun is a real-time strategy video game developed by Westwood Studios and released in 1999. It only supports resolutions of up to 800 by 600 with 16-bit colors, but we can see it runs perfectly on this machine. The Pentium 2 is also very interesting as it has 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache inside the processor but outside of the CPU die. I didn't want to open my Pentium 2, so here is a picture from Tom's hardware. We can see the actual CPU die right in the center and the two cache chips on the outside. Cache is very important and without going into too much technical detail, it basically speeds things up by reducing access to the comparatively slow memory. Now cache is nothing new. You can find cache chips on 386, 486 and socket 7 motherboards. On a 386 and a 486 board, the cache usually comes as a removable chip. More modern socket 7 boards have the cache memory soldered directly onto the motherboard. However, there's an issue. The cache on these motherboards runs at the same speed as the front side bus. So on a Pentium 100 for example, the cache runs at 66 MHz. But on a Pentium 200, which is twice as fast, the cache will still run at only 66 MHz. The problem is that as processors got faster and faster, the cache still ran at 66 MHz, making it less and less effective. Extreme examples are the K62400, which runs at 400 MHz, yet the cache crawls along at a measly 66 MHz. To combat this, AMD put the L2 cache directly into this final Super Socket 7 processors around 1999. Something we will definitely check out in a future video. Now on the Pentium 2, the cache runs at half the speed of the processor. So in the case of our 233 MHz model, the cache runs at around 117 MHz. But on a Pentium 2 400, it runs at 200 MHz. So the speed of the cache increases with faster processors, making sure that it works efficiently. Note that it wouldn't take long for the cache to run at the full speed of the processor. This happened in 1999 with Intel's Pentium 3 as well as AMD's K63.
All of this translates to speed. And despite only having 233 MHz, this is one really cool retro gaming CPU. Here we are playing some Quake 2, a first person shooter video game released in December of 1997. It was developed by id Software and published by Activision. It runs a 1024 by 768 resolution and the game hovers around the 60 FPS and manages to stay above it most of the time. However, we also get dips below which leads to slowdowns and isn't ideal. Still, this game is very playable on this machine. Now, although this machine has a big focus on Windows 98, we are not done with DOS games just yet. Usually, anything that runs Windows 98, people often want to play some good old DOS games. Introduced with the Pentium Pro, the Pentium 2 has memory type range registers. They can be used to get a massive boost for DOS games. I am working on a video that I'll upload soon that goes into more detail about this and what tools you have to use, but in short there are command line tools and when you run them, DOS games run a lot faster. Another cool thing about this CPU is that it is one of the last Intel processors for a long time with an unlocked multiplier. I believe it took until 2005 or 2006 for Intel to offer CPUs again with unlocked multipliers with the Pentium Extreme Edition. While I wasn't able to overclock this processor at all, I had no issues with underclocking it. The 2x and 3x multipliers worked fine and I had the CPU running at 133 or 200 MHz. This can be of interest to those wanting to run older, speed sensitive games. Here are some performance figures with the Pentium 2 running at 133, 200 and 233 MHz in Doom running in MS-DOS mode as well as incoming running on Windows 98. The early Pentium 2 CPUs are manufactured in the larger 350 nm process and do consume a fair amount of power, around 35 watts. These computers draw most of the current through the 5 volt rail. 35 watts is not an issue, but be aware that modern power supplies are built for 12 volt and the 5 volt current ratings are rather low. Like I said, this is not an issue yet with these CPUs because they don't consume enough power for this to cause any issues, but with later processors you got to pay attention to this and I will keep bringing up that issue. These days the Pentium 2 can be easily obtained on eBay. Even here in Australia, and we usually pay a premium, they sell for around 20 Australian dollars. Do check in your region, because prices and availability can vary greatly. Note that the 233 MHz model is the slowest, and often you can get the 300 or 350 model for a lower price. Launched in 1998, Colin McRae Rally is an off-road racing simulation featuring licensed cars, 3D graphics and network support for up to 8 players. We are running this game at 800 by 600 resolution and the game runs extremely consistent, running at 34 FPS most of the time. Let's have a quick look at the system I'm using for this test. First up is the motherboard, it's the 8-bit ABBH6 and I love this motherboard. I only recently got it, but I must say if you have the opportunity to get this motherboard, don't hesitate, grab it, it is a really awesome motherboard. For the Socket 7 results, I'm using the Gigabyte GA5AX. This is also a very uh, legendary motherboard, I would call it, with the Ali chipset. We've got three processors today featured in benchmarks. We've got the AMD K62400 with some tools running to enable the right combined for better VGA graphics under DOS. We've got the Intel Pentium MMX233 and of course we've got the Pentium 2 running at 233. Also we used a fast bit for this CPU to enable right combining. On the Socket 7 machine because of the cacheable uh, size of the memory, we're using only 128 megabytes, 
but on the slot one machine we don't have that limitation so here we're using 256 megabyte of CL2 SD RAM. The graphics card is a fairly high powered NVIDIA Quadro 2 Pro for the AGP interface. We're using a 16 gigabyte SanDisk Ultra SD card in our SD to RD adapter. I've been using these uh, SD to RD adapters for quite some time now and they are growing on me day by day so I can highly recommend uh, using them. Even in, in, in Windows 98 machines they are pretty fast actually. And for the operating system we're running Windows 98 SE including the MS-DOS mode which boots back into MS-DOS 7.1. I have prepared a video to help you guys out with the MS-DOS mode. I get this request all the time. People put, put together a Windows 98 machine but struggling to configuring MS-DOS. So there will be a video for you soon. Two years later, Colin McRae Rally 2.0 is a much more graphically demanding game. At 1024 by 768 and with all details maxed out, the game is a slideshow and the Pentium 2 has no hope in running this game smoothly. Lowering all the details however makes it playable. The performance varies with the amount of cars on the screen. Especially at the beginning we can really feel the FPS going down, but once we are in the lead the game is very consistent and cruises along at around 45 FPS. Okay, time to go over some benchmarks. We start with the DOS stuff first. In 3D Bench 1.0c, the Pentium 2 clearly takes the lead. In Chris's 3D Bench, same picture, Pentium 2 is in front and then we've got the K6 followed by the MMX 233. PC Player Benchmark is a game where the K6 manages to outperform the Pentium 2. At the 640x480 resolution, the K62 is still faster than the Pentium 2. In Doom, the K62 and the MMX233 managed to run the game a little bit faster, but it's not a big deal. Doom has a capped frame rate of 35 FPS. In Quake, the Pentium 2 and the K62 are neck and neck with the MMX233 a little bit behind. At the higher 640x480 resolution, the Pentium 2 233 manages to pull ahead of the K62. For some reason Duke Nukem 3D doesn't run well on the Pentium 2 233. It is the slowest processor in this benchmark. Half-Life Uplink is a demo version of Valve's 1998 first-person shooter Half-Life, released in February of 1999. Uplink features many of the common enemies, characters and weapons from the full game, but the location and scenario in this demonstration do not appear in the full game. We are running the game in OpenGL and at the 1024x768 resolution. And looking at the frame graph, we can see that this game is quite demanding and the Pentium 2 233 certainly has its hands full. We can only see two spikes above 60 FPS but most of the time the game stays around the 30 FPS mark but goes much lower when the action heats up. The drop in FPS in the middle of the graph is just a loading screen so don't worry about that. Let's have a look at some Windows benchmarks. We start off with 3D Mark 2000. The Pentium 2 takes the lead with a small margin in front of the K62. In incoming at 1024x768, the Pentium 2 and the K62 are basically at the same level. The MMX233 can't really keep up with those processors. In GL Quake, the Pentium 2 really shines. 100 FPS is very impressive. In Quake 2, we can see the same pattern, so it looks like all the Quake games really run well on the Pentium 2. You can configure Quake 2 to use a software render which is a great CPU benchmark to compare across machines and here the K62 edges out a small victory. In Quake 3 the trend continues with the Pentium 2 doing really well in the Quake games. MDK2 is another OpenGL game and the Pentium 2 is a little bit ahead of the K62. And the last game we have is Expendable. This is a DirectX benchmark and it's interesting because it shows us the minimum 
the maximum and the average frame rates. So the Pentium 2 233 is a little bit faster than the K62 and the MMX takes up the rear. Enter UNN recruitment facility. Please watch your System Shock 2 is a first person action role playing horror video game released in 1999. We are also running this game at 1024 by 768 and it runs somewhat more consistent than Half-Life. Apart from a few dips, it does run above 30 FPS most of the time, but that silky smooth 60 FPS gameplay is still out of reach. Alright guys, now that was a lot of information to summarize and form a conclusion. When looking at these benchmarks, the Pentium 2 233 is a clear upgrade over the Pentium MMX 233. Apart from Doom and Duke Nukem 3D, it always takes the lead. Now with the K62, which are included just so we have another point of comparison with the Socket 7 platform, and we do have to acknowledge that the K62400 wasn't released for another year. So against this CPU, the Pentium 2 wins 10 benchmarks, whereas the K62 takes the lead in 6. However, 5 of them are in DOS. Note that this is the very slowest Pentium 2, so performance is going to scale quite quickly as we're going to check out some of the faster models and I can't wait to see how they perform. However, there's one feature that the later models do not have and that is the unlocked multiplier. Good performance is great, but in my opinion, having a stable, reliable and compatible system is much more important. The Socket 7 platform is very popular, but it does have various AGP related bugs and issues. I often recommend the Voodoo 3 for Socket 7 machines because it avoids such issues altogether. I can tell you that I always love to work with a slot 1 machine because everything just works and you can focus on the task at hand and don't have to fight technical issues. Screamer 2 is a DOS game with graphics reaching high levels, especially with the 16-bit color option, offering spectacular and highly detailed sceneries. It is a very demanding game though, and just like the Socket 7 machines, the Pentium 2 233 is not fast enough to run this game smoothly. As a gaming machine, a lot of the DOS and Windows games will work just fine, but the machine quickly runs into limits. Be it DOS games at a higher resolution, such as Screamer 2, or more modern Windows games, such as Half-Life or System Shock 2. Slot 1 processors are quite easy to obtain and don't cost that much, but you might have to search a little bit longer for a decent Slot 1 motherboard. Now don't rule out OEM motherboards. Sure, they are a little bit boring and don't have as many BIOS options, but you can't be too picky if you want a good price. This video marks the beginning of a whole range of new video projects. Going forward, we will definitely check out some faster processors, but I will also make a few videos to help you guys set up Windows 98, configure the MS-DOS mode and get the most performance out of your retro gaming PC. Hopefully my videos spread the retro gaming bug and if you're thinking of building a machine, do it. It's a lot of fun and a really cool hobby. Thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, thank you and good on you. As always, if you found this video interesting, please subscribe to my channel so you get updates on future videos. Like, dislike, share the video and comment down below. Did you have a Pentium 2 and how did you find it? And if you didn't, what is your story? Did you hang on to your Socket 7 machine or maybe did you go with AMD? Thank you for watching and I see you soon with another video.